Yep. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Shane Cooper. I'm, I'm the manager of our, the solution consultants with WebRoot. Joining me today is Jonathan Ferrick, the lead product manager for our endpoint solution. Behind the scenes, I've got George Anderson, Craig Papke, and David Stokes. Uh, we've got a set of, set of Q&A set up, so we've got some folks here to answer any questions that may come up as we go through the presentation. So, what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we're going to look into a little bit more about WebRoot, just very briefly, do a little bit of background, kind of catch you up on you know, some things about WebRoot uh, and the endpoint. I'm going to focus a little bit of time just on the endpoint. I mean, that is the heart and soul of our product line. Um, it is what we sell to protect all the endpoints out there. And we'll step through just some things as a reminder for some of you who've been a customer for a long time, and then maybe some new information um, as we go along. We'll talk about the new Evasion Shield, and then we'll dive right into the new console. So a little bit about WebRoot. Um, you know, most folks that are on this call are probably very familiar with WebRoot, but let's talk about the background, the, the platform, the things that make WebRoot, you know, what they are and, and where we get our endpoint information and, and all the data that's supported uh, for those endpoint products, both DNS and endpoint protection. You know, we're a, we supply a lot of information out to a lot of our customers, um, including threat intelligence. And we have a lot of partners beyond just our, our MSP partners and our business partners and our SMB partners. You know, we actually uh, integrate in with a lot of different platforms. And between those platforms, our partners and our own products, we have a lot of sensors out in the world and we have a lot of data collection points. So the WebRoot platform then brings all that data into, to, into a one single platform and we process all the information. Um, a lot of the threat data that we see can be back and delivered um, out within a few minutes. And we also support a Unity API that then provides all that information out to our customers. And we also use that API on our own products internally. So what do we do with all that information and how do we process it? Um, a lot of these terms get thrown around a lot. Um, AI, artificial intelligence. You know, the robots haven't taken over yet, so AI is a bit of a misnomer, but there's a lot of subsets of AI, like machine learning and deep learning. And these are the things that WebRoot really takes advantage of. We gather all that information, we have a lot of different models, and we understand what that information is doing, all the different endpoint uh, uh, agents as they report in, files that they've seen, techniques, behaviors, all that information gets sent over to various models, and we look at, at what that is doing, especially when we get into the unknown environments. And then we process it. We look and say, you know what? This is unknown, but the way it's acting and the way it's looking and the things that are getting processed match these other models that look exactly like um, some other bad actor. And then we take it to the next step by, by deep learning, really getting in there and understanding you know, all that um, information at a, at, a, at a very timely manner and, and basically the idea is to mimic that neural network your brain really think like a human being and process but with a very specific you know focus where we're not too distracted by you know humans we're, we get distracted by things that happen and these devices or the, the software is very focused on trying to determine if these bad actors or the stuff we're seeing that are unknown is something that's maybe potentially malicious. So let's talk a little bit about the agent. You know, the agent is what we call the business endpoint protection. That's what goes out on all the computers. And, you know, we have to step back and think, you know, what's the point? What's the purpose? What are we trying to achieve? And what is the endpoints, you know, design? And we look at, at the things that, that happen on machines and we have to try and catalog them and decide, you know, what's happening on different machines and, and where do they fit in a particular framework? So if you're not familiar with um, MITRE's attack uh, matrix, uh, this is a, a kind of one of their starting points when you first learn about their, their data structure. Um, I'm not here to you know, tell you all about them. Uh, what I do want to do is use an illustration that they use for all the things that happen on endpoints. And this uh, gentleman named D David Bianco built this thing called um, the Pyramid Pain. It's actually quite simple, but what it is is over the years, you know, over the past 30 years in technology, 
a lot of things can easily be uh, validated and kind of put into a certain bucket. We hear a lot about file determination, you know, what is that? Um, and things like hash value, you know, what does all that mean? Well, that is just simply the value of a binary and we, we know what those things are and bad actors can take advantage of that. But this stuff is trivial. You know, knowing of a binary about a file is a very trivial thing, both from a detection perspective as well as a bad actor trying to take advantage of it. So it's not, we don't see it as much, but it's something we still have to be very much aware of. So each one of these aspects are something that the bad actors are using uh, either a, a technique or a methodology to try and get something on a computer. And each one of these can, you know, be a, a vector, if you will, but it's a thing that, um, you know, is supported by technology, IP addresses, domain names, you get into network hosting and artifacts, all that stuff that drives a network. Um, and then the various tools, uh, a lot of people use both valid tools and then malicious actors take advantage of those tools. So tools kind of encompass all kinds of things. What are the tools bad actors do? And as you move up the chain, you know, things get tougher and tougher and tougher. Uh, tools can be very challenging, um, but we, you know, we have a lot of information around, you know, the type of tools and the, and the things that are out there that can be compromised or they can be exploited. The very tip top of the pyramid is uh, is what we call the tough stuff. Um, it is t called TTPs. This is the ta tactics, techniques, and procedures. And this is really where we focus. You know, we do um, capture all the information across up up to this point, um, and all of our products support all this information in some form or fashion. But the really really tough stuff is what we call the TTPs. The tactics are the things that the bad actors use to get on a machine, like like phishing is a tactic. If they send you a phishing email, that's a tactic for them to try to con you into clicking on something. The technique is the software that they design or the or the binary that they build or the script that they try to take advantage of. And those are the techniques. And the combination of those techniques are are a procedure. They follow you know very strict set of procedures to try and you know, get that software or get some kind of malicious code on the device or on your machine to take advantage of something that they want from you on that machine, either it's data or cycle time or any number of things. But this is what we quantify TTPs. And this is what something that WebRit really focuses on, um, a, you know, from our from our endpoint protection perspective. And I really just want to set the stage for how does WebRit work? You know, what does that mean? We have these things. I talk about the techniques and the, the TTPs and uh, techniques, uh, but, you know, how does WebRit approach it? Uh, we've always approached it with a layered approach. Um, you know, our agent's been out there for 15 years. Uh, we, you know, pivoted uh, 11, 11, 12 years ago and really started bringing this to market. And as we did, we, we looked at everything from a layered perspective. Uh, layered means all those different um, attack vectors. We want to look at them. We don't just want to look at one thing. We don't just want to look at file file determination or look at a file or just look at scripts. We want to look at all those different things up and down the, uh, the attack chain. Starting with users, people. People are the weakest link for the most part. They're the ones that the bad actors are trying to con you into or trick you into clicking or doing something or getting something on a machine. While there are those attacks that uh, the bad actors try to get in quietly in on the back end or sneak through firewalls or get in from remote sessions and remote capabilities. And that is still a big problem. That is probably the smaller variant. We do have a high percentage of, of folks still getting in through phishing attempts and those users. So we have products um, not endpoint specific, but we do have products called security awareness training. We talked about that last week. That educates users to keep their head on a swivel and take a look at everything that is happening on their computer. And then DNS protection. We talked about that several weeks ago where we're looking for those um, methods where bad actors are trying to get you or get you to go to a site that might be, um, you know, uh, 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 have a bad set of code on it or what have you. And so the idea there is to stop and block it at the architecture level, not just at the browser level, but any solution that gets on that machine and tries to reach out to a command control center or some kind of server with some bad code. And then the rest of it, malicious URL blocking. We want to stop folks from going to those sites when they're in a browser. In the browser session, we want to make sure that they're not accidentally getting off in to the corners of the web that they shouldn't be, or corners of servers, or wherever that bad malicious you know, activity is happening. Real-time phishing, web exploit prevention, malicious script blocking. That's 
living off the land. That is the, hey, I'm going to try and send you something that looks like an invoice, but under the hood, it's really a PowerShell script or a JavaScript or some script engine that's going to fire that's already on board your computer. And really, it's not an invoice or a, a resume or what have you. It is actually something that's going to fire a bunch of other code, like a command letter, what have you. And then just straight up malicious portable executable files. That's a binary. They built a special binary and they try to get on your computer and run it. All these things we're doing up and down that attack back, attack chain and looking to try and stop and block it from even starting to do something. If it gets past all those defenses, you know, then that file or that thing, <clears throat> we want to take a look at it. And that's really where another area that we really shine. We're looking at those, those unknown things that are going to try and um, act like a bad actor. It's not just, hey, how is the code obfuscated or how is the code got some kind of piece of, you know, malicious uh, pieces inside of it and then just try and do it from a file determination perspective. We actually want to um, understand the exploit they're trying to take advantage of and look at that from a behavior perspective and understand what it's actually doing. What I, what I mean by that is I kind of use the joke of a duck. You know, if he walks like a duck, flies like a duck, swims like a duck, then it's probably a duck. And so if we're looking at that from the all those attributes and aspects from a behavior perspective, then we're going to try and stop and block those bad actors. They're going to try and do bad things. Identity shield, again, malicious portable execution detection. You know, what, what I mean by that is if those files launch, you know, we're going to try and catch it at the launch point, look at the, act, the things that it calls, uh, pre-execution analysis, if you will, to try and decide, hey, is this thing from the get-go uh, looking bad? And then at the end of the whole thing, if everything goes awry, because no one's 100%, we do our best, we put our best foot forward, we have really good ratings uh, with, with the testers, with SE Labs, um, and we do our best, but things still slip through, and so we ultimately rely on backups, good reliable backups, and that is something that we profess from uh, from the entire the, the entire protected chain up and down. A little bit just, I just want to remind everybody, this is what the WebRoot agent looks like. Uh, it's just standard. Your users can see the different settings that are on there. Um, if it's locked to a policy, they cannot you know get to this, but it's just something that we get to see every day. And what, what are some of the things that that agent does? Uh, we really talk about the size. You know, it's a small footprint. It's only five meg. It gets installed very quickly. We can be up and running in 60 seconds. You know, that agent does a learning scan. It looks at everything on the machine. And then we focus and we catalog it. We go, you know what? These are all good things. Let's just focus on the things that we don't know about. And even when it's off network, we're very protected. We're looking at uh, act things that might get in, injected in our uh, injected or inserted into a computer. Um, everything is, you know, very well protected across, you know, whether it's online or offline. Again, I'm not going to read all this, but it's looking at all the different vectors again. As I said, we're looking at, you know, how long these things have been out in the wild. We're looking at script protection. This, all this stuff that we're doing is way beyond just your standard um, security tool. AV, everybody calls it. We, I like to shy away from that term because we're not AV by any stretch. We're an advanced endpoint security tool. So how does it do it? You know, we, we talk about all that information. We've got all that stuff on our platform. We've got all these layers of protection, but ultimately some kind of bad file or, or file list or file code lit, uh, command lit or something is gonna try and get on that machine. And we have all that data. We have all that easy stuff. We have all those hash files. We have all that, all that URL information. And we're gonna look at that from a, from a predictive known perspective and say, we, are, we know this is good, we know it's bad. Good, let it run, it's cool. And we get it cataloged and we'll never mess with you again. And we know you're bad, we're gonna get you off the machine, we're gonna stop and block you immediately. But where we really shine is that deep learning protection, that behavior aspect, all those attributes and actual behavior. What is this thing really doing? Don't just write in a piece of code, try and figure out and ascertain the obfuscated code and what it's doing, what we think it might do, let's see what that what that thing does. It goes back to walks like a duck, flies like a duck, and swims like a duck, then it's probably a duck. So we do all kinds of fun stuff there. We look at the hash value, try to figure out what it is. We record it, we capture that information so we can certainly protect others if we start to see more of that. And then we do things like behavior analytics and, and try and catalog and categorize, categorize what that is. And then, of course, in the background, we have all this data. We have the known file hash databases. We have behavior databases. That's those, you know, what's it doing kind of aspect. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff, too. We have some secret sauce that we don't really reveal, but we have a lot of known information around, you know, bad actors and these unknown um, systems. And so we try to stop and block it. 
All right, so here's the next big one we've been working on the past couple of years, um, and that's called Evasion Shield. So Jonathan Farrick is on board. He is our uh, uh, lead product manager for the endpoint. He's going to kind of walk you through some of the Evasion Shield aspects, um, both current and coming down the road. Thank you very much, Shane. Hi, everybody. So um, I won't read the slides too much, but I do want to keep it up because one thing that we're occasionally asked about is, what is Webroot doing to keep up with the evolving threat landscape and new forms of malware? So I briefly want to talk about our evasion shield because uh, I think it's a great example of Webroot's continued investment into innovative detection technologies and automating the response based on machine learning in order to enhance the protection against various forms of highly evasive malware. Uh, evasion shield was first introduced last year with the release of its subcomponent script protection, and that was designed to enhance protection against malicious file based and fileless scripts. We also have an upcoming release of foreign code shield uh, that should be available in the near future. And that is also going to be a subcomponent of the evasion shield uh, and foreign code shields expected to improve efficacy by moving protection up higher and earlier in the attack chain and is expected to raise early detection and prevention significantly. And one thing is we're going to continuously be enhancing our evasion shield kept capabilities in order to ensure that end users and all the devices are protected from the evolving threats while also ensuring minimal impact to the end users devices. Uh, as Shane mentioned earlier, ac uh, actually, I don't think you mentioned it. Uh, it was just on the slide, but one thing is, uh, but people may or may not be aware uh, is that we received the triple A rating from SC labs. And that is uh, actually the highest rating available uh, as part of that testing. And I mention this because Evasion Shield played a major role in that testing. And this just further demonstrates our focus on efficacy, our ability to protect against modern threats, as well as emphasizing the significance of Evasion Shield with regards to protection. So with that in mind, I just want to remind everybody that the Evasion Shield settings are disabled by default and that you know as an admin you need to actually go in and manually enable them via policy that way you can ensure you have the highest level of protection so if you haven't already done so uh, you can go in for our script protection and enable that uh, and then once foreign code shield is available in the near future you can go in and turn that on as well uh, and with that back over to you shane awesome thanks Jonathan. i did briefly mention it but i didn't really point it out um, so i'll kind of do that in our summary so just to quickly summarize, endpoint protection, what's its job? You know what, Webber does the easy stuff. I showed you on that paramed, there's all those things that we do. We do the easy stuff. We got that, we got you covered. And then we focus on the tough stuff, like Jonathan just mentioned. Uh, we're continually increasing our efficacy, increasing the opportunity to try and catch the bad actors, however they're trying to get on the machines. So that's the tough stuff. And how are we doing that? We're doing it with predictive behavior analysis, using all those years of um, artificial intelligence, which is really machine learning and deep learning, those models that get improved on an everyday basis, all that information, it's kind of like a living, breathing thing. All that information comes in. We continually process it and make sure it's back available to all of our endpoints and ultimately to you and your customers. We use that layered approach. We don't just look at one thing. We don't just look at scripts. We don't just look at files. We don't just look at um, um, new things that are showing up. We do all of it. We don't just look at websites. We try to capture everything that layered approach. The entire the entire attack chain is is got some touch. We we touch and look at every single layer. Ultimately, Webroot is stopping the bad actors. That's really what we do. We try to stop it. We're not gonna. We have some alerting capabilities, but we feel like hey, once you get an alert, that's too late. We really try to stop it at the point of attack. All right, so we got the endpoint. We kind of built up to that. Now, how do we manage it? You know, today we have a console um, that has been around for a number of years. It's had a nice evolution. We've added a lot of features to it, um, but here we're about to roll out the brand new console starting next week on April 27th. We went from this. Our 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 console has had this look and feel for as long as I've been with Webroot, and we're moving to this, which is basically a nice new modern uh, user interface and we focused on the user experience one thing before i jump into live con the, the live demo just kind of set the stage it's more than just pretty pictures while that's a, a primary focus and usability and the experience is very very important we really want to make that faster easier better um, underneath it all is our code we completely rewrote this software 
um, from the ground up starting several years ago. This project didn't start just a few months ago. We actually started the project well back what, way before uh, 2019, planning stages 17, 18, and then 2019 they kicked it off. In the past two years, we spent a lot of time on the code. And here's the, the value to you. That code is in a modular form. It's in a fast deploy form. So we will be able to quickly uh, release a new feature set. And that's what we're really excited about. So once we get the core um, code base out next week, uh, over the next couple of months, be looking for a lot of new feature sets added on. We did a lot of nice stuff um, from the get-go, and we still have a ton of work to go. So with that, I'm going to drop out of PowerPoint and get over to the browser. Make sure everybody can see it okay. Browser okay, I'm going to get a quick thumbs up from somebody. I I kept talking this morning and George had to tell me it wasn't showing properly, so I'm just ver verifying that it's running okay. I can see it. Perfect. Thanks, Sean. All right, so this is the the, the new interface. Um, it's very similar from a under underlying architecture perspective. Nothing has changed there. Still multi-tenancy, still multi-client. So for every customer you have, you can have a corresponding site, and we still manage that. We still re report on that. We've just simply moved a lot of the configuration buttons from the top over to the left. Uh, again, a very modern, common uh, interface design uh, approach. And so we're following you know, very good practices that many other companies have followed as well. Do things like I can hide it so I can give myself more real estate, just kind of a nice new feature. As we add ability, we'll, we'll increase the buttons on the left. But the main screen uh, is still the, the, the um, individual customers and individual sites. What we've done is we've increased the ability to quickly get to the information that I need. For instance, if I see these um, uh, needs attention. I'm going to show you that in a moment. We now have flyovers. We have visual cues showing me, you know, as my mouse moves over a particular line, the entire line highlights. So it lets me know, you know, what I'm looking at. It's got the key code. All that information is still there. What we've done is we've been able to provide and expand and contract uh, of the different products and the different columns. And as we add more, we will be able to increase the ability here. But the nice thing is very quickly, I can see the total number of, of things that are being supported and protected for this particular customer Apex technology. Uh, we're moved to a, a concept called entities. Everything is considered an entity. So every endpoint, every DNS agent, and every uh, security awareness training target is considered an entity. And then every network forwarding from an IP perspective on the DNS side, those are all individual entities. So in this case, I've got 22 of those. Where do those numbers come from? Those are a, a, a combination of endpoint protection, DNS protection, and security awareness training. So we've got some nice flyovers. I can mouse over any one of these you know, products. I can get to the configuration. I can get to the um, setup and, and or def define specific information around it. I can click on the hyperlinks. I'm not gonna do all that because I kind of want to stay in a particular area. I don't want to jump the jump too much, but if I want to go to the 14 targets for security awareness training, that's a hyperlink, it would take me straight there. And the same with the 16 computers, it would take me straight there. And then I can do some things like, I can manage it as well. There's one more user interface where I can now see all of them. And the reason I didn't jump over there is because it's the same uh, sort concept. I really want to focus on a technician comes in and says, hey, I've got some things I need to look at, needs attention. How do I get there? Just simply click the view devices and it takes me to the entities tab. And that's where we can manage all the uh, entities, all the endpoints, and all the different um, areas of computer, you know, all the different endpoint computers. And that's what I've done here. Instead of having to go find it, it takes me straight to this one that has a problem. I click on that computer, and now I see all the rich data associated to that. In a nice, clean user interface, um, I can see the policy. I can see all the different information around it. I can see the current user. I can also jump over to the threats detected tab, and I can make some quick decisions. I can look at this and say, I don't know what set.exe is, but I can now look at it in a more granular uh, point and say, I don't know what this is. I'm going to let WebRoot just take its, do its job. In this case, it's already done its job. It's already quarantined it, um, or I can take some action on it. Maybe I need to um, get it out of quarantine. Maybe it was a false positive. It happens. But while I'm here, I'm working on this computer. I can do other things like agent commands. I can immediately invoke an agent command again without having to jump back to a list find that computer click it and do a little you know jumping through some hoops everything i need is right here at my fingertips 
I can change policy. Let's say I want to remote into this computer and I want to switch the policy to unmanaged. So I want to get into the, the system and I don't want to have to have it locked down. I might want to change some settings. I could do that very quickly right here by just simply saying, you know, switch to unmanaged, the unmanaged policy. Or I can just define a different policy and assign a different policy. Uh, again, if it's just part of my daily job. Look at scan history, look at web thread shield. Again, everything about this computer is pretty much right here at my fingertips. So I, I kind of talked about entities uh, in the current uh, console. It's called groups at the top. We've changed that. Groups really didn't make a lot of sense. It's it's there, um, but the reality is it's, a, it's an entity manager, not a group manager. While groups are a component and they're definitely available, all that information is still there. So all that stuff that you already have organized in groups and by site, will come over just fine. Uh, none of that will be changed or modified, but you can now add more. One of the nice things about the user interface and a lot of different aspects and areas is we incorporate flyover. So you don't have to guess what that button does. There's this plus button, it adds a group. So I've got all sites, I've got Apex. And if you also notice, buttons won't highlight and, or activate until they can actually do something. So I can't add a group until I actually say, hey, where do I want that group to go? In this case, Apex technology. So I can create a group, assign some things to it, but I've got some groups already made. So I can now cycle through those groups. I can quickly grab computers and look at them. I can look at all the computers and all the entities, including the IP addresses. I can mouse over and look at the policies assigned to those computers or that particular endpoint. And you'll notice I've got nice highlights so I can see where I'm working. So if I look at this one, I know that it's Apex Sales because I've got a nice blue bar that's giving me a clear indication as to what I'm looking at. I can do some things across multiple computers. I can change policies um, by simply selecting uh, multiple computers, not just one, and do some things like uninstall or re-verify, change key code, any one of those agent commands, or change policy, or move them into a different computer, uh, different different group. Again, everything I, I, I have is right here at my fingertips. I'm gonna jump back to sites really quickly because um, that's kind of the entities and looking at computer and endpoints. Now, how do I configure my uh, sites and manage my various sites? One thing that is very different is the hyperlink of the actual client site no longer takes you to uh, what we call an endpoint business console. It takes you to the configuration manager of this respective site. Uh, just kind of be forewarned, uh, that old original uh, console is slowly going to be um, sunsetted. Uh, over the next couple of months. It is still available. I'll show you a little trick of where that is, um, but the hyperlink no longer takes you there. It takes me to the management and configuration of this respective customer. What I can do now is quickly look at all those settings. I can look at the admin permissions. I can look at the endpoint protection, the DNS protection, security awareness training uh, setup and configuration for this customer. What's really nice is I'm looking at the details. I'm looking at endpoint and I decide, you know what, I want to look at another customer. I just simply grab the selector at the top and drill down to another customer, and it persistently stays on the tab that I was on, because more than likely, I want to look at the uh, recommended default policy for this for each customer, so I can cycle through them and without having to jump back and forth. This is a, a deactivated one. <clears throat> or I can go to a deactive one, and here's a nice new feature. Let me get to the summary. Um, I have deactivated this site, and it's still showing up on my console and I want it to go away. And now you can do that. You can actually delete the site altogether. And it is destructive and permanent. It is not uh, reversible. So if you do delete it, it's gonna pop up. Do you really, really wanna delete? Once you do that, it goes away from your console forever and ever and never to be seen again, uh, the end. Now the data that's associated with those endpoints does get archived. So that is still uh, feeding into that platform feeding into those databases. So we all have, we still have all that good rich data, but you are no longer worried about that deactivated site cluttering up your console. All right, so I've talked about sites, uh, talked about how we can manage all the different aspects, how we can manage it better now with the deleting of those deactive sites. What about policies? So policies are still the same. We, we create policies at what we call this global level or at the main management console level. Uh, we're again, we're going to try to move away from site policies. If you do have site policies, you can certainly bring them up. Um, I actually forgot one thing to show you. I promised I would do it and I forgot. 
I need to get to my old endpoint console because I'm comfortable with it, or there's something very specific that you like to see there. Um, it is still here. You go to the, the respective site, the endpoint protection tab, and endpoint protection console. That will take you to the old console. It's the same look and feel. We still have the color scheme, but it takes you to that old console, which is not getting any kind of updates. It is no longer going to have any modifications or changes. So if it's broken or doing something today, it's going to be that way until we completely sunset it. But it is still there. So if you do have some site only policies that you need to bring up and import to the global level, we can still access that console and get some things done. All right, back to the global policies. So what are some new features about the policies? I can, uh, I've got a whole new visibility of what they look like and how they edit. If you're familiar with our current policy editor, there's a big menu choice you have to select and flip between the settings. Now it's all turned down. So I can just simply roll down and turn down the different settings, turn down core, turn down behavior. Uh, maybe I want to go down and turn down evasion shield and see what's there. So it's very quick to find those different sections. And for new customers or even customers that haven't been in the console in a while, it's a much faster way to quickly get back to those settings and remember that there's there's many more settings than the, than just that one. I mean, the old days we saw basic configuration, there's about 15 settings. You'd look and go, oh, there's not that many settings until you realize there's a menu choice. So it's a little bit clear and more um, you know straightforward. Nice new feature is, where is this policy being used? So I'm in this workstation defaults policy. If you notice, we have a persistent bar at the top that tells me, kind of gives me some feedback as to what policy I'm working on. So if I scroll away, I don't have to remember I'm in the workstation policy. I can actually quickly see that. I can also look down and say, hey, look, it's in Apex. I'm using in an Apex technology. There are five workstations in Apex technology with this policy assigned. Out of 16, I've got five using this policy. And I want to hyperlink and look at those. I don't want to go find them somewhere else. I pull up those endpoints right here and I can see that these are the five. I can see when they checked in. I can see these are all pretty recent. So they're they're checking in and active. Uh, eventually, again, a nice cool feature that will be coming down the pipe at some point is once I see this, then of course the next thing I want to do is I want to click on it and go to that computer and take a look at it in more in more granular detail. It's coming again. We're gonna we're gonna add a lot more. Uh, fun features um, as the as the console uh, moves forward. Another nice feature is, and I clicked away because my mouse clicked, is is persistence on uh, savability or changes. In other words, I've come in here, I've turned this on, and and I've decided I want to turn these things on for this particular policy. You'll notice at the bottom the bar lights up, the save button lights up. Uh, but let's say I decide I wasn't paying attention. I didn't notice that bar and I click away. Now we've got a, a capability that's going to always monitor those that that session and say, you know what? You just tried to move away. If I hit the back button or try to move to another section. It's going to pop up and say, hey, there's an unsaved setting. Do you want to save it? Do you want to stay on the page and save? Or do you just want to go ahead and hit exit and move on to what you are attempting to do? There are some areas of the old console that um, don't catch that. Um, sometimes you can make changes and move away and it will not alert you that there's a change that has not been affected. So very powerful, very uh, you know new feature that is persistent across the entire interface. All right, so overrides. Uh, overrides hasn't changed a whole lot. There's not a lot, a lot of new cool things to show there. Uh, we've just using the new modules, the new code base. Um, again, there's going to be a lot of attention given to some of the manageability of these features, these other areas, uh, but today it's the same basic setup and configuration. Um, if you make a change, it's going to require you to hit the save button, things of that nature. Um, security awareness training, very similar to what you see today on the main console. Um, you can go in there and create your campaigns, add your users, look at the content. Everything you really need to get started is right here um, at the main console, uh, but the general look and feel underneath hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, it's now just conforming to the modular aspect of the, of the existing console or the new console. Same with reports. Reports hasn't changed a whole lot. Again, I think there's going to be a lot of work coming down the pipe on reports and alerts, uh, but the same type of reports are there today. Um, alerts are the same. So you create an alert today, it's going to send you information. But as you can see, the way the interface works is we've got a lot of room to grow, a lot of areas. We can expand the capabilities and there's a lot of um, nice discussions going on around how we're going to expand uh, both the alerts and the reports section. 
Another area that is going to get a lot of attention is the admins area. We have opened it up. We, pre we presented a little bit more information in a column form where I can I can sort my different um, uh, admin lists. You know, in our case, we have a couple of hundred people, about 115 in our system for for demonstration purposes. Uh, you may not have this many, but sometimes it gets a little. You got 10, 15. You got to look around and try and find things. We're trying to make it as easy as possible. Um, I can quickly see that you know which ones have 2FA, which ones don't. I can also take action, like I can edit. So I want to edit this user. I can go in and make some changes. Again, this is right now just we brought over to everything as is today, um, but there will be a little bit more attention given to this. Uh, one question that probably will come up, or I'll just go ahead and answer it now. Um, uh, require uh, the requirement ability uh, to require everyone to have 2FA did not make it in this one. Um, there's definitely a lot of potential coming around the pipe. Uh, that's one thing right now you still have to let everybody know they need to do it themselves, uh, but that is something that is being worked on, so it's coming down the, down the road. Uh, if you have any site-only admins, all those get transported over just fine to the new console, so those are still there, and we still support that mechanism. We still support that ability, so if you've got that, you know, if you're doing a co-manage with a different customer and they need to come in and look at the endpoints, um, they're going to see, um, you know, they're going to see the old console for now, which is why we haven't gotten rid of it. And then in the future, as we expand the ability uh, to get very granular with the uh, admin privileges, then we'll be able to provide a, a more rich user experience with this interface. So they'll they'll come in and be able to see only the areas that they are given permission to see. So if they're a user customer or customer, they're probably not going to be able to come in and modify policies or modify overrides. Um, or they could. I mean, again, we we, we may set those permissions, those depths up to give them that ability, uh, but that would be the, the way it's going to work. So then they come in and look at entities, and when they look at entities, they're just going to see their customer, I mean, their site and their entities. So the overarching uh, configuration and the settings, um, mo again, most of that's all been transported over. It's the same as it was before, just conforming to the new look and feel, the new color scheme. Um, block page for um, our Web Threat Shield and DNS is now moved to the settings area. It was tucked in the um, uh, overrides area, which really didn't kind of make a lot of sense. It's an over, you know, it's a it's a global setting, that a global configuration. So we've moved it here, makes a lot more sense. And then API, all that information is all still here. And then as we expand the capabilities, you can definitely detect that we're, we'll be able to add additional functionality um, as the products dictate. Uh, dashboards hasn't changed a whole lot either. Same concept. The information is there, um, but again, we're going to be expanding in the future. Uh, new expanded functionality here, um, so very similar to what you see today. Um, some of the others, uh, help, help, all the help information is all coming over. Resource center, um, the support area is still there. So if you click on the support section under the qu question mark, it's going to take you directly to an area where you can create a. Uh, support ticket directly within the console. That's actually there today, and it's just being uh, represented with the new user look and feel. And then lastly, I can modify my own settings or log out. So that's pretty much it in a, in a nutshell. That's the new console. That's some of the nice new things that we've been working on with the endpoint protection. A little bit of background history on you know what the endpoint is doing, what we focus on. Um, and with that, uh, I will let you have the rest of your day or night, depending on where you're calling in from. Uh, we do have some questions that have come through. I see, I kind of looked in the corner of my eye on my other monitor, and it looks like uh, Craig or Dave have been very diligent about keeping those up to <laughs> don't listen to shame. Okay, so I don't know if there's any uh, other questions that may come in. I know we have a few more minutes. Um, there's really not much else to show on the new interface. I think everyone's going to be able to jump right in and not have too much trouble with it, be able to get in and find everything. Um, and hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, so when on Tuesday or Wednesday of next week, when you log in and see the new interface, uh, you should be able to dive into where you need to go. Uh, there was a question about the slide deck. I think, yes, uh, that's already been answered. Um, all the presentations will be prov pr provided. Um, there will be a recording of this, and I think they're going to post that out on the community for reference. You can come back in and reference it. So I don't know, um, Dave or, or Craig, was there no, uh, any questions that came in that I'm not catching? I don't know if um, I, I don't have it up. And so just wanted to look to see if there's anything else, Craig. 
Yeah, it looks like a question just came in about um, it, does this have any effect on the ConnectWise Automate plugin? Ah, yeah, good question. Um, that, we got that one this morning as well. None of the RMMs uh, or integrations will be affected at all. The API, all that information is not dependent on the console. It has its own uh, framework and all that integration will still be the same. If you notice, we didn't change key code structure. We didn't change the way the agents report in. The agent still checks in, uh, gets installed and checks into that respective site and all that still is stay, stays the same. So we won't have any uh, ramifications if you're uh, supporting any of our partner, not just the RMMs. We've got a lot of integrations with a variety of different customers uh, from <clears throat> MDRs to reporting technologies to RMMs and we have it with the different PSAs uh, like Manage and Kaseya. Uh, all that integration will stay right in place and keep on humming and work without any problems whatsoever. Great. Um, another question here is uh, asking you to repeat what you were talking about with 2FA. Uh, maybe if we can um, show that again. Oh, uh, fair enough. I'm, the I might not... qu yeah, the question around it is, is it not available at all or just not a requirement? Sorry, I, no, it's totally available. None of that's changed. If you're using 2FA today, uh, it's going to come right over. All that user experience will still be exactly the same. What I was trying to say and probably did a poor job was that we've had a lot of requests asking for a force requirement. Uh, clicking a button at the top that says, I want to force all my users to use 2FA, no questions asked. Um, that didn't make it into the first cut. So that's just something that's coming. I was kind of trying to head off a potential question and probably didn't do a great job at it, um, but that's what I meant. No, the 2FA enablement will still be there. And if you've already got it enabled, that will just keep on uh, the way it is today. It'll ask you for that second factor and you'll be able to put that, that code in and get in just fine. But those that are disabled, um, those are still using the old security code, which we don't think is strong enough. And it really would be nice to be able to force all my users to use 2FA. So hopefully that cleared it up and I was a little Great. bit more transparent on that one. <laughs> um, next next one is uh, about policies. So uh, the, the John here wrote, I'm sorry, I might have missed it, but if site policy is going away, how can we go about with granular control of the policy on a site level within the global policy? <laughs> That's a good question, actually. Ultimately, the, the site management structure uh, will go away. Uh, policies are independent things. So we have global policies and site policies, and they're independent of each other. If you still need to, and I'll go ahead and show it, if you need to get to a site policy and manage it, you can still do that. Uh, the, the caveat there is that that policy um, has limitations. The new evasion shield and a lot of the new functionality will no longer be supported at that site level. So the old style is still there. Uh, we added the color scheme and the buttons at the top to match the user interface, but you'll notice this old style is still there. So I can get to those policies. Um, I can edit them in their in, in their current form, uh, but I but I can't take advantage of, of the new features. Evasion Shield, DNS, none of that's managed at this level. What I can see is what's coming from the global level. And let's say, you know, you're, you start planning to move towards doing everything at the main console and you need this policy. Most people aren't aware that if you hit the import button um, at the global level, you can pull these policies up to the global level. So you don't have to recreate them or you don't have to go and capture all the settings. You can literally import it up. So that console is still there, uh, but if I go back to the sites list, which is getting me back up to the main console, if I go to that policies area, um, what I meant by that is, let's say I'm at the global level and we do suggest and advise uh, to manage your policies at the global level and then make that available to all the sites. Um, that setting is still there as well. When you make that site, it, there's a setting that says allow global policies and allow global overrides. That setting is still there. And once in the future, when we uh, move away from the management console, that will just automatically be set. But let's say I have a policy at the site level and I want to bring it up to the global level. It just simply click the import button, select the site, I'm going to kind of click off of that. I have a huge list. I, I participate in a number of consoles, so I don't want to have to 
uh, pull up this big list. In fact, I've got some tested consoles that are showing up as well. But the idea is I pick the site. Um, you're going to have a much more narrowed focus on just your sites. And then you pick the policy within that site. And when you hit the import button, it brings all those settings and the site name up to the global level. And then you can make it available to all your customers. Or you can make it available to just that customer in the meantime, if that's what you need. Great. That, that sparked another um, a, a good policy question about site-based policies, um, where the question is, will, will the site policies get imported to the new site, or do we need to manually recreate them? And uh, it looks like George is uh, actively responding to this one <laughs> as well. Um, the, but maybe a little bit more clarification around uh, the new new site, I am assuming here, is uh, yeah, the console. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, assuming it's the new console, and then how will they get imported? So maybe some clarification around sure, sure. what is really changing. So everything that's set up today is going to come over in, in total. So there's nothing going to change. So if you've got site-only policies that are associated to that site, that's coming with. There's no, there's no need to recreate those. Um, so everything you do today is coming just fine. Uh, you will not lose any of that. You do not have to recreate it. What I'm kind of projecting is the future as we start communicating that that old site management console will be uh, sunsetted. We'll definitely give you lo lots and lots of heads up. No one's going to rip that out and force you to have to make those policies. I was kind of walking you through a scenario of uh, preparing that uh, that in the future time frame uh, because a lot of times all the new features that we're rolling out, like a, like Jonathan mentioned, the evasion shield, that is not available at the site level. So that's a key security feature that we really feel strongly about that needs to be enabled. So I'm very bullish and very pro on having all your policies man managed at the global level. And so if there's anything you could do or start to consider or start thinking about moving those policies out of those site specific uh, uh, management areas, then you know you might want to start considering that. So that's really what I was getting at. Maybe not doing a great job at it, but all that information is coming over. You will not lose any information. All your users will still be the same. Nothing will change there. Um, it's literally just a new look and feel. Uh, we want to take a little bit of baby steps. We didn't want to change everything drastically in one fell swoop, uh, but those changes will be coming down the pipe. And hopefully that uh, gave you some confidence that yeah, and to, to squelch any concerns that we're going to have you rewrite all those policies. Everything's still intact. All the endpoints will get those same policies. Nothing will change there. Anything else? That is it for questions. We've, we've tackled them all. So thank awesome. you, Shane. All right. Well, I see we have about 10, 15 minutes, 10, 11 minutes left. Um, that's really all it is, all I had to present. And I hopefully hope that was helpful for you guys. Um, I will let you have the rest of your day back if you're um, just getting your day started. And I'll let you have your evening back if you're just in the afternoon. Thanks for joining.